it was warm. Like the sushi was all warm, like room temperature. But we all ate it's it. Because like plants stuff. English, they're trying to make them happy. Is that where like I fell out of the wheelchair and then jumped up and said, I've been healed, I've been healed. And everybody said, I don't remember that part, but yeah. Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rohde. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Rohde, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy the show. Todd Ortmeyer has toured as an audio engineer and as a tour production and stage manager. He's worked for Morgan Wallen, Florida Georgia Line, Miranda Lambert, Dirks Bentley, Lone Star, Leanne Womack, Patty Loveless, John Michael Montgomery, Tracy Lawrence, Wade Hayes, Pirates of the Mississippi, Harry Connick Jr., and Gallagher. He was voted Production Manager of the Year for CMA Touring SRO Awards in 2014, and he's been nominated for the same award several other years. The second guest is Chris Lyle. He's a production designer, lighting designer, production manager, and show producer. He's worked for Alice Cooper, Robert Plant, Jason Aldean, Judah and the Lion, Lollapalooza, Bonnaroo, the NFL Draft, Miranda Lambert, One Republic, Dave Koz, Danny Goki, Sugarland, Billy Currington, Peter Frampton, Nick Carter, Kenny Babyface Edmonds, Chris Young, Jennifer Nettles, Lee Bryce, Kip Moore, Chase Rice, Sarah Evans, Keith Urban, Leanne Rimes, Leanne Womack, and Phil Vassar. Did you see how I kind of went down with the NFL? <laughs> you, you, Why did you leave us when you came back? But my, my <laughs> first question is to Todd. And my first question to you is, what does shoot down the night mean to you, Todd? Shoot down the night is a banshee song. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and that was one of my first road gigs, like first touring get on a bus with a heavy metal band kind of gigs. It was a, a bluebird school bus, but it was, you know, I made it big time. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I heard it in another interview. So I did a little dive and I started listening to the guys and uh, that was, they were good, man. Great production quality. Yeah, good you musicians. Know, yeah. It was, it was hair metal days, you know, spandex, aquanet, hairspray, things like that. That uh, is that you or yeah. them? Uh <laughs> Back then, maybe a little bit of both, you know, nice. mostly them. <laughs> okay. And uh, now, so you got, and you two, so you two know each other because of the Leon Womack tour, or it just happens to be that you both worked for her at one point? That could I, I be met a... Todd Ortmeyer. I don't know if Todd remembers this. I met Todd Ortmeyer in 1995. I was doing a tour called the Walmart Country Music Across America Tour, which is literally what you think it is. Parking lots of Walmarts. Uh, parking lots really? of Walmarts. And, Todd, you were either out with Wade Hayes or George Dukas, and I couldn't remember which one it was. I think it was George Dukas. George Dukas. Todd was the, the, the PM, and I was the little LD kid. And the Walmart tour. So they set up a stage in the parking lot, or you play on the, on the uh, pavement? No, we said we had a little a, a small version of a stage line, and we would, we would roll into these Walmarts set up in the parking lot. And we would only hop cities like 50 miles a day. So it was like this super easy schedule um, like we loaded in at like 10 a.m. Sound checks at one, bands from like seven to eight thirty, and then we loaded out and go to a hotel. So really easy to go um, get lunch and stuff. That's kind of it right. was. You know, it's funny. The first year they didn't provide any runners because you were in the parking lot of exactly Walmart. I would be a good runner at that gig. I actually might have actually been all right. <laughs> we we had fun. Like we were all in our early twenties. Like I was 20, 22. and um. I did that tour for three years and the first year was fun. But then the second year they made us all sign agreement saying we wouldn't go in and fraternize with Walmart employees. Like we were all young single guys. And so we would, we would go in and like cruise the deli department to see if there are any babes at the Walmart because, you know, we were staying in town that night. So the question is, is, who's the guy, Arkansas, who's the guy that ruined it? 
who's the one and went in and hit on somebody who was like, no, 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 no. I'm not making you a sandwich and get the fuck out. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think um, it was one of those things that uh, uh, something went overboard one night and an email or, or at that time a phone call was made to somebody else. And yeah, ultimately, yeah, the next year was like, you guys don't go in and fraternize with Walmart employees. <laughs> So we had to just mind our manners from then on out. But, then, but yet you survived another year after that one too. You know? I, well, I never had game. I, I wasn't a threat. Like I was the one that would just, uh, I'd get the scraps if anything, but. Uh, well, uh, should we tell them your nickname back then? I had, I've had several nicknames. Which one was that? Uh, that one, I, back then, weren't you the chubby assassin? That's my pro wrestler nickname. Back then, I would, they called me Stuart. <laughs> Cause I look like the little fat kid on Beavis and Butthead, Stuart. And I even had a shirt made that said winger on it. Um, <laughs> but that's one of my many industry nicknames back then. And then it went away when you turned with Dave cause it was like, we have to, we have to up it. We have to up your game. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Did you do exactly. any of those tours with him on the cruise ship? No, I've, I've done his Christmas tour for the past five or six years. And I don't know if you know, Dave, that guy is so freaking cool. He's just a great guy. Yeah. And it's a nice one of those things we do at the end of the year. It's like a nice cap off of the year and kind of get you in the holiday spirit, whatnot. And one of the questions I like to ask guys, I usually ask it towards the end, but since we started off with Walmart, you know, what are the, some of the craziest gigs that each of you guys have worked at the places that stand out the Walmarts of the world? Are there any other tour locations or gigs that you guys have done that are standalone? <laughs> I mean, I, I'll throw a couple. I mean, I've done shows on top of parking lot garages, you know, and you literally had to push everything up, you know, through the parking lot, you know, switch backs as you go up to get up top. Um, I mean, that isn't necessarily bad. It just sucked for the stage hands. Um, Playing to the cars. Everybody sit on a yeah, car. It was, yeah, and then they let like 50 people up there, 75 people. It was like VIP, you know, type party. That's um, big. What band was that for? You know what? You, I don't even remember. I think it was back in the... Uh, it would be good if the answer was like the cars. It was for... Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then, you know, getting into country, which... I'd spent a lot of time in, I mean, hell there's mud and dust tour, you know, fairs and festivals where you, you run across every corn dog and every, uh, you know, snow cone and, you know, Fried cheese curds. Yep. Grand, grandpa and grandma come out and yell at the front of house guy because he's making too much noise, tuning the PA and, you know, things like that. <laughs> So you yell at them. You say, "Listen, man, I, I used to work for a hair band. I kick your ass." We, <laughs> on one tour, we had uh, we had code words, and it, everything was, "Can I buy you a hot dog?" And so they would come give they would come give the front of house guy crap. And this was a go ongoing thing to the point as production manager, I asked him to change the song because it was literally annoying people and and. Uh, and he and so we we just came up with this and he'd call on the radio and he'd be like, hey, uh, I need to buy somebody a hot dog, you know, and that was just the code word that he was getting hassled out front, you know. So our one on STP was, uh, are we speaking in code names, which was uh, from what was that Nicolas Cage movie Raising Arizona? Oh, yeah. We speaking in code names. And that was just sort of like, what the hell did that guy just say to me? <laughs> you know, we used to have on years ago, Tracy Lawrence said they were big NASCAR fans and walkie talkie channels were called out by NASCAR names. Oh, so neat. Say, go to Earnhardt, you know, go to Wallace, go to that was that was code. And if you didn't know the NASCAR names, you didn't know what channel they were going to. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Mark Hogue. Do you guys know Hogue? Yeah. That would yeah. be a Mark Hogue tour thing. <laughs> I could see that happening. So you got any funny gigs, Chris, other than the, uh, the Walmart? Well, no, yeah. It's <laughs> funny because I still can't get over. I mean, I, I, it honestly makes sense, though. We're talking mass money. We're talking, you know, different. I, I could see it being a tour, but at the same time, it's a hell of a funny tour. It's a the definite Walmart? resume builder. Yeah, the Walmart dude, tour. Dude, I did 181 shows on that tour without a day off. I mean, literally shows seven days a week. I was 22, 181 days in a row. 
and we had we changed out bands every week so every every monday we got two new bands so i tell you what as a kid coming up in the industry talking about a networking like it was awesome because i was meeting all these pms like todd and um and, and i did 181 shows in walmart parking lots Summer and you were a lighting guy i was the lighting guy for a daytime show that's the kicker of it i yeah. had 20 bar cans so i you mean just had two sticks like what well, wouldn't even that like they it was just like these random it was just it was dumb and I look at photos now and it was like, man, that was the easiest gig I could have ever been given. No wonder we were chasing tail in Walmart because we had nothing else to do. Was Until they ban so... you. So then you yeah. walk around the parking lot like, oh, look at the homeless lady. They had a great little scenario going because the generator was mounted on the back of the truck that pulled the stage and all the cables and everything stayed in the side of the stage. So they literally, they would pull up at 10 o'clock in the morning and, you know, and by 1130, the whole thing was folded out and ready to go. You know, I just picture like 10 roadies seeing this homeless lady pushing a Walmart shopping cart and be like, can't do it. She might work there. <laughs> you <can> get fired. <laughs> you got to know your audience for sure. Yeah, you got to exactly. know. You got to know. I don't want to get canned off the Walmart store. <laughs> but anyway. Um, uh, so I was listening yesterday. I was in prep for today. I was listening to, to Zito's podcast and Zito is a good friend of both Todd's and mine. Okay. And um, Zito was telling stories about doing shows with Babyface for the Russian mafia. Here's the best part. I also went and did shows in Russia for the Russian mafia with Babyface, totally separate than what Zito was talking about. Wow. The mob that is one of my wackiest gigs. Like we, I, I was the PMLD at the time. And we got hired to come to Moscow and play this, this, um, this nightclub at the bottom of a hotel. And we knew, you, you just knew as soon as you walked in what was going on. And we did two nights there, but it was for the Russian mafia. Like full on, went to the elevator, elevator opens in the hotel lobby, dude's in there with like a machine gun. You get in, you go down, you, you, you get escorted. There's casinos, there's all these hot, beautiful Russian girls, like as dealers at these blackjack table tables and stuff in this little basement and then there's this tiny nightclub that sat like 50 people and um it was for the russian mob and like literally they sat us down to eat and there was no menus it was like uh, uh they're like what do you want to eat and they're like well, where's the menu and like no what do you want to eat it was literally like what do you want we're gonna make it for you wow crazy so crazy did you order um, fried cheese curds I didn't, you know, I, I didn't have my Russian uh, translator. Uh, she wasn't able to translate curd. It was weird. We got cheesed, but the curd just could not get that out. of. I thought place. you would have tried. I know you, you know, <laughs> it, I, I tried a lot. Baby face does sort of sound mafia esque though. So maybe that's it. Maybe they're just looking through the like Elton John. No, not mafia. It'll be like baby face. Ah, <laughs> so here's one of those things that you kind of put two and two together. The opening act, Again, this beautiful girl kind of could sing, but not really. Was the was was it turns out we all pieced this together. Oh, this is one of the head guys. That's his that's his lady. And um, and she was our opening act. So I think a lot of this was almost a ploy to get babyface uh there as the, the creative producer type to meet this girl who couldn't really sing. Wow. Yeah, as I was gonna say, Russian mafia could be watching this and now I'm fucked. So there you go. Uh they didn't kill Zito. <laughs> <laughs> they right. haven't killed zito yet no nah, no nah, that's yeah. true I, th I think it's the cinnamon bruns oh they're like don't kill the cinnamon I, gun guy speaking of cinnamon rolls he needs to get his ass off tour and get back into town and pay, bake some runs some rolls He's done. Yeah, we could do an online petition it might be the first one that actually means anything <laughs> to go yeah. yeah i mean he he oh. says that was just a one and done thing he, he doesn't plan on yeah i don't want to do it cinnamon rolls anymore but they were good they were wow. really good so good coming from a fat guy i mean i i know <laughs> cinnamon rolls I'm a, I'm a, you know paul spriggs the name sounds paul. familiar but he retired and he opened up a sweet shop in santa barbara so oh. that's what he's up to i don't know tangent but hey anyway so we love Cody selling sweets. Yeah, man. He's uh I th hopefully he's doing good. I don't know. It's a tough time to open up a shop. So I hope he's kicking ass with it. Cause it's uh, you know what's funny. I don't know if you I don't know if you know this, but I you know, a couple of us, we have a nonprofit here in town called the Tour and Career Workshop. And um over the pandemic, we started a sub page on that 
called Crafty Roadies. And it was basically this page where we collected info of all these road crew who had these side hustles, whether it was making things, food, arts and crafts, whatever. I would be in the back of your book, man. It would be like me. I'm going to throw out a boy's name in there and just be like, these are the worthless guys that do jack <laughs> shit when they're not working. <laughs> but no, man, like there were some people that did that, that. We've got some creative, awesome people that beyond their jobs in our industry, like they were some, somebody that made like these those German roasted nuts and like coffee and burgers. And like, there's, we've got some, we're, we're an industry of eaters, I think. Yeah. And we eat fast. That's the thing. Every day I get yelled at. You're eating yeah. too quickly. That's why I'm like, just give me water. I need water. But I just inhale it as quick as I can. And I get yelled at every day, but I don't yeah. learn. I actually just said that at lunch. Uh, we had a meeting earlier and then we went over to a burger joint across the, and, and see Lyle Fred literally like inhaled his lunch and everybody yeah. was done. And another stage manager, friend of ours, Fred Yonda. And uh, anyway, we just, I mean, he inhaled it and it was like, yeah. damn, slow down, son. Yep. It's exciting. They're going to do an autopsy of a roadie. They're going to find like whole cheeseburgers and chicken legs inside of us. There's no doubt. And I'm okay with that. It's better than that jackass movie where they found a guy's uh, car, a car in the guy's ass. That, oh, remember the little toy car? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't get them guys. I mean, I, you know, that's just. Yeah, but then I find there's myself. There's a limit laughing. to stupidity. Yeah. Jousting in the parking lot. I don't know. It was, it was hilarious to me, and it's not it's stupid. I don't know. They're yeah. taking a shit at the Home Depot. I, I don't know why, but I'm laughing my ass off going, it's not funny, but I'm still laughing. I'm yeah, still laughing. Exactly. That's just it. It's 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 not, but we are. And Works. they've gotten ri- they've gotten rich off it. Oh yeah, for real. All right. When I first started this podcast, I was uh, hanging out at my buddy's house. He has a daughter in fifth grade and the young girl and her friends came up with a question. They said I should ask every guest. And the question was, when did you first feel famous? So if fame is not a road you want to pursue in answering this little girl's question, when was the first time you guys had a moment in your careers that was a uh, catalyst? It was the next stepping stone. It was an event that meant something to you. It was a kernel in time something like that. Or if you just want to talk about being famous, you could do that too. She'll be happy. <laughs> but it's, it's a good question from a little kid. So I like to ask it. You go, Lyle. I mean, definitely don't, I've never felt famous. I don't think that's my calling, but understanding what she was asking. Like, I think the first year that I actually was able to go and do what I do for a living and make a living at it without having to do an other job was the, the, that point in my life is when I felt like, okay, this is a thing. Like I can now tell mom and dad, no, look, I can make a living doing this. And is that and last year? Right. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was during the pandemic. Yeah. No, uh, that was actually it was the, the year before. Tour. It was two years yeah. ago. Yeah. But uh, yeah, probably just when I realized like, yeah, that was like, oh, wow, I could actually do something with this and make a living. So it was cool. Did you still keep your stuff in your parents' house? No, I mean, you know, eventually the rent went up too much and I had to leave. So, you know, Parents are sticklers. yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> have to get rid of your GI Joe collection. Yep. Yep. You can only pawn so many Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and then you just got to go. You know, the comic book, the first one, like the real one or whatever is crazy. It's a hundred thousand dollars or something. If you have it in perfect condition, Teenage Turtles, that's nuts to me. I don't know. Todd? Funny, side, funny side story to that, the the tour manager on Gallagher, his manager, when I toured with Gallagher was uh, a name guy named Gary Proper. And he's one of the visions and the, uh, the startups between behind Teenage Ninja Mutant. Uh, wow. Can't even say it. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. See, we need to get Gallagher to do a tour with the turtle guys. There you go. You'd have to hit those shells a hell of a lot of time to break them. Gallagher's getting old. It could be an interesting tour. I don't know if they make enough uh, weed for them to smoke to get that, you know, get that tour on the road. Yeah. <laughs> what was the tour with walk? Gallagher like? I mean, you were, what were you doing? PMing or? I did like just audio on that one. Uh, it was weird. It was a comedian, but yet we carried a half a load of half a truck load full of props and, and, Visqueen. We used to hang black visqueen as backdrops on the stage. And we used to put the whole floor of the stage was 
was visqueen and chairs used to get trash bags put over the top of them and i used to mix uh sound from side of stage and i would take two mic stands and build them up and then angle them up over the top and take like clear plastic and make myself a shield because when he'd get out there and start smashing stuff and you'd have mouthwash and jello and everything just come flying it's like an insane clown posse uh, introduction yeah <laughs> it's good except and he's it, been around a little uh, longer yeah he used to live around the corner from me i think oh yeah i think so I, don't know. I wonder how a comedian like that even i wonder how that moment what that moment was like like oh i'm gonna go and smash shit on stage like how does somebody have that epiphany beating up mailboxes as a kid it, it just could stuck be. with him maybe maybe people making fun of his haircut and mustache just anger i mean but then if you take it to the next level he's he's figured out how to aim projectile fruit and stuff like that i mean he the guy actually is you know there's a, there's a little bit of an art to it because he hits things at certain angles because he wants them to go in certain directions and I mean, he neat. actually there's there's actually a little bit of thought to it you know what's interesting is so he didn't do a television show that i'm aware of if he's been a writer on shows which might be i'm not aware of it so all that guy did is bust his ass touring year after year to make money i, I mean it. It's tough work. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. that acting isn't, but uh that's how you can make some real money is movies and stuff. I'm sure he's been in stuff, but I would I wouldn't remember. I wouldn't know. And yet most people know who he is. So it says a lot. I think what? everybody knows him as the watermelon guy. Watermelon dude, yeah. yeah. Todd, do you still have his rider? I'd love to see his rider. Like how many, what's the shit he asked for to uh, yeah. I'd have to go back and dig it up, but yeah, I it I mean couple of things and he used to come into the venue every morning about 9 30 10 o'clock and he'd go straight to his dressing room and he'd have to have a certain kind of tea and a fruit platter and a daily several daily newspapers from the local city we're in because he he fed off local you know local news a lot anyway and then the writer was mostly all the fruit and all the you know mouthwash and jello and uh trying to think of all the stuff he used to smash and then literally like rolls of visqueen plastic to cover everything up and trash bags to to put over the seats and clean it all up um but i mean he you know a little side side funny he would uh he would go to his dressing room and he would sit there and read the local newspapers all day long he would like i said in his show he would feed from the local news but part of my job was to walk back to uh the dressing room and get him and walk him to stage while the intro was going on and you'd have thought we were in a cheech and chong movie because when you'd open that dressing room door that smoke would just billow out and so you knew that he was just sitting in there all day long reading local news getting stoned you know did he laugh at the local news? I wonder. He'd be like, hmm. "Oh, he, yeah, he would make fun of it." I mean, just, just stupid stuff. And I mean, that that was most of his stick was making fun of stupid things and stupid people, or making your brain think he would turn stuff. You know, why? You know, one of his big ones I always remember was, "Why is it called a hot water heater? Don't we just need to get cold water hot?" You know. Yeah, I just heard this English comedian do one of these things yesterday on some show. It came through my podcast or my Facebook thing or whatever, but it was good. It was American English versus England. And it was, uh, it, it was, uh, what was the big one? It was, ah, uh, I'm having a brain fart. But that's what he picked on was the hot water heater. Why do you need it? Oh, it was there they have the bin. Here we have waste paper basket. So did we start off with like clean, nice paper? And then when, well, this isn't going to work. And then we went to waste paper and he finishes off his routine with uh, horseback riding. Where were we trying to ride the horse before the back part? <laughs> <laughs> That's That's awesome. Funny, man. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was, that was his whole stick as well. It was just making fun of, you know, 
local things he's seen or or heard or or and just you know play on words stuff. Yeah, he's a neat guy. He's got to be seventy, right? And he's got to be probably even. I don't pushing. know. Pushing, pushing higher than that, I'd say. Yeah. But. Well, cool. And then uh, you guys both prefer the country acts or um, whatever. Whatever pays. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we both live in Nashville, so that tends to be a lot of the clientele you get. Um, I mean, I love working with rock acts. Like, you know, I, I did Alice's, Alice Cooper's last tour design and like that like man what a fun thing but like country pays the bills like that's what's here and I, I like some of the country music it's but it's not the first thing i'm gonna put on either what do you like i'm, I'm like foo fighters is my jam like stuff like that like uh um just rock alt rock you know yeah, and i'll go through phases like thing. yeah which one are you todd i'm a, i'm like a little bit older i like foos as well but but just you know Rush, Triumph, uh, you know, some of the older classic, I don't know, prog rock, I'm, whatever you want to call it. I'm bad. You know, I've noticed because you say your favorite bands and stuff. But when was the last time you put Triumph on? And it was like, oh, okay, I guess it's been a while, but it doesn't mean they're not good. It's like, all right, what did you listen to recently? And for me, it's like classical. You're like classical, like classic rock? Nope. Get in the car and all I ever have on is classical. It's like, are you a violent driver? No, I'm just a boring person. <laughs> but, <laughs> what I like about the classical is like, so who is this person? I don't know. Beethoven or Bach? I mean, how could you listen this much and have no idea? I'm like, oh. Yeah, it's chill. It's good. And then now I'll listen to like, I got bands coming on. I actually just had on uh, Blue Oyster Cult, the brothers from Blue Oyster Cult. And so I was listening to some of that stuff. And there's some great Blue Oyster Cult songs that uh, mm -hmm. I'd never even heard, actually. A lot of their uh, off songs are awesome. So oh, that's always a little bit of fun. And then, then you have your, you know, who do you really like? Like, oh, Counting Crows. Counting Crows? Yeah, they're fucking great. And fuck you for asking. <laughs> 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 don't make fun of me, man. Don't I was going to say, th fuck you for judging me. Yeah, don't you judge me. Uh -huh. Dick. Counting Crows. <laughs> well, I don't know if you guys had any other stories you wanted to share. You're welcome to share them. And if not absolutely appreciate your time but uh if you got any other fun stuff you got any shit to talk about zito you're welcome to do so <laughs> oh zito i've got i love me some zito you know it's amazing um, like uh everybody the guy everybody really likes that guy and it's, it's an awesome thing it's a wonderful feather in the hat but um he's like the uh he's like the dolly parton of roadies you know can't don't talk shit about zito <laughs> We like Zito. Oh. And I'm like, is it just because the guy is a good baker? And they're like, oh, we love Zito. <laughs> That's, I like that analogy, though. I kind of see some Photoshop in my future here. Oh, yeah. Zito, <laughs> yeah. Zito and Dolly Parton. Man, Chris, uh, Chris, is, Chris is known to take, you know, photos of, of things and, and uh, put different faces and heads on them and, you know, spread Well, if you want to make your own little. Uh, a lonely guy cover thing of this or whatever it is. what do you call it i don't know what i have to do it now it's uh i stick your guys's faces and then, then people click on it ah gotcha well a little photoshop fun there a little uh a i just learned how to do it it's kind of a bitch man photoshop ain't that easy it's once you get the easy. gist but even though i got the gist i'm still like oh come on i can't fucking remember how do i just move it that way right but yet but yet you can get a 10 year old kid you know that can do it on his iphone in like half the time you know i'm getting used to not being good at stuff <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, not, it's not that much of a problem and so hence the editing of this show <laughs> but you know it's okay i'm not editing a movie right Ma master it. master of all trades just not this one just yeah not today not today man not today What's your guys' favorite country actor? What's your guys' next gig with? <laughs> is that your next favorite country act as the next dude? Be the proper <laughs> answer. But I mean, I've been working. I did Brooks and Dunn's latest tour, their reboot tour. I did the design on that. And I've like, that's my current project I have out in the country world and done. It was a blast it's because literally they're, they're great guys, but like every song is a hit. Even though I don't listen to a ton of country, like, you know, all these songs from, the past 30 years or whatever like it yeah that's uh that's been a blast and um 
you know, I literally went through and pulled out some of their old set pieces and reincorporated them into our show. And oh, you know, that's been fun. Like that was a blast. So was that your idea or their idea? No, I mean, I, I went to Bandit Lights as the lighting provider and I went to shop and I saw these pieces that I've seen for years, just collecting dust, these big, they would call them the ribs. Um, and uh, they're just sitting up there. I'm like, who owns them? And they're like, well, Brooks and Dunn owns them. I'm like, let's, let's figure out a place for them on this tour. I mean, this is a reboot tour. Let's find a home. And, and uh, we did. And it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's cool. It's, it was fun to, to dust off the archives. They must have loved it too. Yeah, I mean, it, it saved them money because we they already owned it. So that you know, and uh, but they loved the look. It was you know, it was a nice throwback to you know their tours in the early two thousands or whatever. Yeah, I remember with the uh, with STP again. They had the uh, lava lamps. They'd done a tour with lava lamps, these massive lava lamps, and they would just sit in storage. And in the storage, they had bought these big uh, covers. They were like uh, honestly, they were like furniture blankets, but they were meant to cover these lava lamps, which just huge and just years and years and years of just sitting and taking all this space so what do you do with it all you know well that's and todd todd can speak into this too because he's had the pm experience but you know here in nashville there's a building called sound check um obviously we do tour rehearsals there or uh, our acts do and but they also have storage and one of the big warehouses they have or had used people used to store all these sets these custom built sets we're talking things like they incorporated cars and pickup trucks and all these palm trees from a Kenny Chesney tour. I mean, a warehouse full of old sets that just sit there and collect dust. And um, sadly, the, the Nashville floods of 2010 wiped out most of it. But it was literally like walking through a tour museum of, oh, that's Carrie Underwood, this tour, and Jimmy Buffett, and, and so forth. It, it's, it was kind of a cool place. I don't know, if, Todd, is it still there? They have, they, it's kind of rebuilt after the floods with, but not with all the cool stuff, kind of like you're talking about, but, um, and I think the owner, Ben, he kind of had an initiative at one point in time and kind of started uh, cutting some of it up and, and selling it off in pieces, you know, with their approval and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, if you, if there was a way you could go in there and go, Hey, I want this from this tour and that from that tour and this from this tour. Can I, can I rent them from you? You know, the problem is the stuff's so big and heavy um, usually. And so who's going to stick that up in their living room? And so <laughs> the stuff it's stuck. It's the little things that are easy. Cause you put them. So up. you're saying that's a bad thing. <laughs> well, it's, it's harder to break them for us, <laughs> but for collector people, it's kind of bad. You know, how much is it going to cost to make a plexiglass? you know case for the brooks and dunn ribs like, right oh <laughs> my living room's not that big so <laughs> i did i had luck going through there though todd it before the floods like i mean there's so many four by eight decks sitting in there if you had a baby act with no budget you could find some risers and, and call the pm for whatever act and be like hey you want to part with a few four bites or black drape i mean there were some decent little finds in there it's like pickers you know like like yeah. barn picking for roadies you know what would be good to do with it all is russian mafia they would love all that stuff right russian mafia would love some good use set pieces probably i especially right about i now. i, I, I kind of see in a baby face tour you know and you, you design it with a bunch of old set pieces yeah with a, a baby face with palm trees and carrie underwood's pickup truck and the little big town risers or whatever yeah we could we could do a little we could do a little fun with that see he's always working <laughs> his yeah. mind's just woo just going how can oh. we save him yeah let's do it what were your other nicknames oh gosh uh at Verilite, i was a Verilite boy for a very short time i was spanky and they're always a, a revolve around my way it was spanky and stewart the chubby assassin was my pro wrestler nickname because i did some work around pro wrestling and i don't mean in the ring i mean like roadie work um c lyle which is not that fun uh, it's just my first initial last name that's been the one that stuck that's been with me over the years and some people have that's called me best. asshole i don't know what that's about though see uh, c lyle has some variations to it as well depending on how much alcohol you drink you kind of slide the c into the lyle you know lyle, lyle. lyle. Oh. yeah we've had a few of those nights yeah but uh there was a know. wheelchair in vegas i i remember one one story on that but was i in a wheelchair or are you in the wheelchair you were in a wheelchair and me and richter were pushing you around in the casino in vegas 
Oh shit! See, I literally don't remember that, but I believe it. That's I got a picture. At. It pops up every now <laughs> and then on my, on my slideshow. <laughs> Is that where like I fell out of the wheelchair, then jumped up and said, "I've been healed. I've been healed." And everybody. I don't remember that part, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're playing nice. We, we got into a lot of trouble that night. Vegas has become that nemesis town for me. Like I've already had to go to Vegas four times this year and I've still got another festival and LDI this year. Like I just, something always goes South in Vegas for me. And it's like, I just, it's like you want to misbehave in Vegas. It's awful. Do you gamble? I, I like blackjack. i like blackjack. That's my thing. But like when I was there for NFL draft, I uh, played some roulette. Like it's, you know, but I'm talking like 20 or 30 bucks. Like I can't, I can't do this hundred dollars a hand stuff. There's no way. Do they still give you guys chips when you get to the hotel? They'll give you a bit of like 20 bucks in chips to go spend or nah. Like the, the hotel themselves give it. Yeah. No, not, not in my experience. No, they have you had that time. No. Yeah. Uh, I had that a couple of times where they gave us all a couple bucks and then go off and spend i'm just not a big gambler i don't like it i get nervous i don't know i used to like the bars in vegas but my favorite bar cities are new orleans or boston i love the bars in boston they're just they're they're fun but now the world's changing and that these micro breweries are uh, in existence and so now i've changed because i'll go in and be like this is seriously like actually good i'm drinking so mm -hmm. now there's a brewery out here called institution that i love and so going there and it, it, it's a beer garden there's all these kids there running around they got good pizza and i'm kind of like it's okay to be a drunk fat guy <laughs> <laughs> just don't yeah. talk to the kids right just don't talk to that guy's kids and you're good to go <laughs> that, that was what's funny is, it, yeah in my, as my career evolved you know, i came off the road touring in 2014 but as my career evolved you know i was young we used to go seek out clubs or whatever but as I got older and, and, and married and whatnot, it became more like seeking out like good food. Like that's all we care about was yeah. good food. And that's what I miss the most about actively touring right now and being on the road is finding like those, that killer restaurant find that, that place you'll remember the name and you'll go back and hit every time you're in town. Yeah, or sometimes the after show food, if you get someone who wants to spend a few minutes and they'll bring you some of the greatest stuff of the area that I used to love just... I'm still not a big pizza eater and people that don't work in the industry don't get it, but um, yeah. <laughs> hey, I got a good, here's a good, uh, here, let's, let's, let's merge a couple stories here. So sure. I uh, went back to Russia with Robert Plant. I was his uh, PMLD. This was um, 2013, 2012, 2013. Um, we played, we played Moscow. We played St. Petersburg and after show food in Moscow, we got on the bus. It was sushi. And my first warning sign should have been that um, it was warm. Like the sushi was all warm, like room temperature. But we all ate it. Because plants time. English. They're trying to make them happy. See, there you go. It's not all about you, Chris. The, the, the crew bus, it was two Americans and then eight Brits. So we leave Moscow. And we're heading to the Ukraine. Our next show is in Kiev, Ukraine. And we get to the Ukrainian border. And by the time we hit the Ukrainian border, let's call it at 4 a.m., the entire bus has now come down with the shits. And I mean bad. And the Ukrainian border, like we're held up at the border. They won't let us through because ultimately they're looking for a payout. That's the way I'm going to tell the story is they were looking for a handout. And we were at that border for six hours. Um, a whole bus of us that have now have food poisoning from the warm sushi. Mm. And I remember like going into the, uh, the customs office or whatever and um, I apparently went in the women's restroom because I can't read Ukrainian. And uh, I got berated by this Ukrainian woman coming out of there, A, because I must have stank it up, but she was pissed. But uh, ultimately, we ended up throwing the guards some, some, uh, some shirts, and they ended up letting us through. But that was the most miserable six hours of being on the road in my career. Was the Ukrainian woman really Robert Plant, and you didn't recognize it? <laughs> <laughs> I thought he sounded... no. Man, Robert, I don't know if you've, if you've ever worked Robert. Just a what a fantastic guy. Like I, I that was a good one to end my touring career on. He's just a good dude. Yeah, was Allison Krauss or this is this, this is, is with Allison Krauss in 2014? Have they been together a really long time? Um, I did. So this was Band of Joy. So now I think about it, this. Actually, might have been 11 or 12, and then I did Sensational Space Shifters in 12, 13, 14. 
So this was the Band of Joy. No, yes, this was the Band of Joy tour. I know he's been wanting to come on this thing, but eh, so I don't know. Maybe I'll talk to him about it. <laughs> I'm sure he's it. got some stories. You know, I had Snake Sabo on and I just kept picking on him for being a rock star. It was so much fun. <laughs> Every time I'd say anything, I'd be like, shut up, rock star. <laughs> and, and I'd go back to the roadies. What did you have to say that was important? <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know. Robert Plant, though, there's so much to it. The guy's been pre- relevant for so, so very long. I think you've had all the ups and downs and all the rest of it. So I'd like to think you go back to what you were, which was a good dude, even if you had ever been a bad guy, which I'm not saying he was, but um, yeah, you hear nice things about the Mick Jaggers and the Elton Johns and a lot of these big guys. They're decent folk. So yeah. the last thing they probably want to talk about is their music. And then you're good to go. If you talk about anything else, you're good. <laughs> so. Right. Steering that comment back to the one about working in country, you know, uh, that's one of the things I find that I, that keeps me working country is because the people are, you know, the artists are so nice. I, I, I can take a rock tour or take a country tour and two things. I mean, the country tours probably, you know, probably got nicer people to deal with. And in country, we, we call it weekend warrior touring you get to actually have some sort of home life. You know, you, you, you go out on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're home Sunday to mo- Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you know. Where, where did you grow up, Todd? In a little town uh, just north of Omaha, Nebraska. So oh. farm, farm boy was raised on a farm, pigs and cows and horses and, uh, you know, Road, road rodeo for a while on, you know, did, did rodeo and somehow chose sex, drugs, and rock and roll over, <laughs> over, you know, rodeo. So what was your first gig? Uh, little bar band called, shoot, I can't even remember what their name is. I couldn't even drive. I was 15 years old. The keyboard player had to come pick me up and take me to the bar we played. 15 year old we're in a bar playing five nights a week you know and uh i had to go sit in the dressing room i'd mix sound during the show and then go sit in the dressing room because they didn't wouldn't let me in the bar you know that's awesome and that's right. in omaha or outside of omaha little town west point nebraska it's north of omaha about 75 miles wow see now you can go in there at like 12 years old and drink as much as you want yeah <laughs> times have changed <laughs> where are you from chris i am a fourth generation nashvillian this this is home oh. i'm at home oh yeah a this lot of is- nashville people now is transplants that i talk to obviously so uh a lot yeah yeah no i grew up here my my great-grandparents grew up here like it's it's home man uh, town's changed but i still love it you know it's it's i'm proud of this town and i do a lot with the city and yeah it's home that's good that nonprofit thing that you guys started. So, um, how does it go about? If I'm a roadie and I'm a good cook or something, I can get a hold of you and then I make stuff for people and give it away. Well, or what, what are you guys about? Or... <laughs> so it's called the touring career workshop. Oh, Zito did it. Yeah, Zito, Zito did it. It's like yeah. based out of your garage and everybody makes yeah. it right there and they eat it. Or yeah, no, it's a legit. No, it's a full on five hundred one c three. I mean, we are uh, our moniker is that you know we are human resources for touring professionals and. We do a big workshop every fall. It's free. Um, it's sponsored by various companies within our industry. And basically people come in and can learn about health insurance, tax planning, business licenses, contracts and legal stuff, staying healthy on the road, all these different human resources related topics. And Marriage. Uh, marriage, yeah. We, we, we have a, a program where we pay for counseling. If you're in need of counseling, we've got some counselors. We cover your, that cost. Uh, but yeah, just during the pandemic, we started the crafty roadies portion of our site mm-hmm. just to kind of collect all these people were on their Facebook pages posting like, Hey, I'm making uh, uh, masks or I'm, I've got that. I've got, I'm, you know, got my own coffee or whatever. So we just collected all these and put them on a website. So you they're still up on the website and you're people making candles or, um, or whatever. What's the website? Uh, www.touringcareerworkshop.com. Nice and short. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Just take you five or 10 minutes to type that in. You'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> I like it in all honesty. It's good. So if I it's, wanted it's, uh, it's I, good. I, it's good stuff. It's, you know. Yeah. That's no, good. For to both, get back for both old and young. 
Yeah, hence the Zito and Chris Musgrave and some of these guys working hard at trying to give back. You know, it's it's yep. it's good. So yeah. thank you for doing it too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, it's it's awesome, man. Well, cool. All right. Well, if you guys have anything else you wish to add, I don't care. We're done. <laughs> no, no, you can if you want. If there's anything else you guys wish to add, you're welcome to do so. Otherwise, I really do appreciate your time and uh hope to talk more yeah no it was, thank you for having us on yeah that was, well, was good thanks for watching don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right to learn more about me or the guests on the show go to joelrody.com you can follow us on twitter instagram or tiktok the handles joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, don't be a dick. <laughs>